The scripture reading this evening is from Psalm 28. It can be found on page 460 in the Black Bibles. To you, O Lord, I call my rock. Be not deaf to me, lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for your help when I lift up my hands toward your most holy sanctuary. Do not drag me off with the wicked, with the workers of evil, who speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. Give to them according to their work and according to the evil of their deeds. Give to them according to the work of their hands. Render them their due reward, because they do not regard the works of the Lord or the works of his hands, He will tear them down and build them up no more. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exults and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. O save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. The word of the Lord. Thank you, John. Well, good evening to you. Um, uh, We are starting a new series this week talking about the Psalms. And kind of before I get into it, I just want to tell you why I'm particularly excited about this. Um, The Psalms are given to us, you know, so we can know the heart of God, of course, but they give us a prayer language. If you're wondering about how to speak about God or how to think about God or how to talk about him in a way that's accurate and true, the Psalms are a very good place to go. And Psalm 28 is like that. It actually gives us a prayer language. It gives us the ability to speak to God, to know that the words we're using are accurate about who he is, to validate emotions we have, which we'll talk about a lot of those in the text today, both in hoping in him, in him and in doubting him. Like all of those things, the Psalms do such a good job crystallizing that for us and giving us the ability to know how to speak to God, to receive from God. And so this summer, as we move through the Psalms together, I want to encourage you to do that. Maybe this week, you know, read Psalm 28 a few times. And pray those words. You're about to spend 30 minutes thinking about this psalm in particular. And um, just to, to stand on that and think, I'm going to commune with God. I'm going to use Psalm 28 to do that. And, you know, each week as we go through Psalm 29 and beyond, uh, I just it's, it's an opportunity for you this summer. So let me pray for us, and then we'll jump into Psalm 28. Okay? Let's pray. Father, we do give you thanks that you have given us your word um, to communicate to us, your love for us, to enable us to commune with you and know you and speak to you ask that we'd use the word this evening to do that in our hearts, to open our minds, um, all of who we are, to who you are, that you might shape us by the power of your grace given to us in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. So I just want you to think for a minute, have you, have you ever seen something that is so grand, and so wonderful, that when you see it, it just takes all of who you are in that moment? It just makes you pause. And maybe it's so interesting or so profound or so wonderful that you kind of even forget what you were doing just before this moment. I mean, have you ever, have you ever experienced anything like that? Um, in the beginning of this month, I had an opportunity, and I did that a few times, okay? Jamie's parents took us on this trip to Alaska. And look, I've, I've seen lots of Discovery Channel, okay? I watched Bush people before. Like, I've, I've seen Alaska, right? Wrong. You know, when you go there, it is so grand, and it is so big, and it's so wonderful. It's like every time you turn around, you're like, what? That's amazing. Oh, my goodness. You know, there's, there's a whale. There's a, an e- a bald eagle dropping out of the sky and picking up a salmon. Like, it's, 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 it's mind-boggling as you're there and it sort of makes you pause and I remember one morning I woke up we had just finished part of most of the the trip and we were going into what's called the indicate arm and um, it, as you make your way into the indicate arm there are gla- there are icebergs that begin floating by okay and you know being from Texas I haven't seen a lot of icebergs up close and I'm looking at these things and I'm like this, this is crazy like, I saw the Titanic. Should I be worried, right? There's all these big blocks of ice that were, like, floating by. And um, it, it's amazing. And, you know, as they're making their way by, you, if you can just imagine this, there's this water. It's a fjord, okay? I know what that means now. And um, it, it's, 
it, it, the water actually changes color because some of it is more clear and then there's this cloudy part of the water and what's going on there is the glacier is letting off all this little fine powder like dust as it grinds away the earth over thousands of years and it's releasing it into the water and you can actually see like a differentiation between the water that has that in it and the water that doesn't have that in it and so we're making our way into the Endicott Arm we come around this bend and there it is Dawes Glacier discovered by this dude in 1891 Dawes finds this glacier and it is like miles and miles long it's 1200 feet tall it's thousands of years old and when you look at it if you think you've seen a lot of different hues of blue I just would challenge it because after you look at this glacier it's like every kind of blue that might Crayola might be able to ever come up with is right there and it's just mind-boggling and you look at it and I remember thinking to myself this happened on multiple occasions but especially that morning as our giant ship is doing 360 showing us the glacier and all this stuff um I thought to myself Lord there's no one like you like there's no one more creative than you I couldn't have come up with this and this is just like one glacier among many on one part of the planet in one time period I'm looking at this block of ice that understand this thousands of years old it's amazing and as as you you can't help but look at it and think that is incredible it provokes awe in you when you read psalm 28 that's what's going on in the heart of the psalmist he's peering into the realities of who god is and it's making him pause and he's thinking wow god you are so big and you are so grand and there's so much to you and and you're approaching me and this is amazing it's incredible now, there's actually words that you can take from Psalm 28 to learn how to speak to God in this way about his grandeur and about his strength, that he's the shield, that he's a rock to stand on. All these things that God wants you to know about him, which is super important for you to understand. Both in the really good times, that's great, and it gives you like a knowledge of how to celebrate and what to celebrate, but also in your really difficult times. That there is a God who is that powerful and that grand, who one speck in the small part of his creation, this Dawes Glacier, is enough to make you just pause. Because God is that big and that wonderful. And so kind of the main ideas for this evening that I want us to think about is how we are, we are meant, God desires for us to have a prayerful sort of knowledge. A knowledge about how to pray to him, but also a hopefulness in our prayer. God, God wants us to know who he is and then to live in light of it. You know, as Presbyterians, we're pretty good at knowledge. Like all your pastors have like tons and tons and tons of postgraduate study hours. And we study all the time. We think if you could have been at General Assembly this week, you would have seen a lot of this kind of, you know, discussion happen at a high level or whatever. But God is so much more interested in you actually having hope in him from that knowledge. That the knowledge itself is, is not enough. And so let's start with this kind of idea of a knowledgeable awareness of who God is, knowing who he is. Now, this past week, we had Vacation Bible School. Clay mentioned it. You saw a video about it. If you'd have been here on Monday morning, you would have seen hundreds of kids come in, and they, they come in, and the first thing they see is a bunch of stars on the ceilings, on the ceiling, all these stars. And then they come down in front of the sanctuary, and there's a solar system. And then they come into the foyer here and there's these neon lights. And Clay told me he wants to get those installed all over the church. He wants to have those everywhere. These purple neon black lights. It's just super cool. And then they come in here and there's more stars here. And there's a background. And, you know, there's Jupiter and Mars and all these signs. And Andromeda and Galileo, as you saw. All these cosmological things. And every kid in there is thinking, wow, something is happening here. Like, what is this about? You know, the psalmist is, as you read the psalm, you're meant to have that sort of experience. That there's something going on here in the scriptures that we're meant to understand. That even as you heard these children speak, it was so beautiful to hear them talk about the things they, they learned from Vacation Bible School. But planting these seeds of just how amazing God is in the earliest days of their life so that he will walk with them throughout that's, that's why our children's ministry exists. It's why we do Vacation Bible School. It's why we try to love on children because we want them to know just how incredible this God is. You know, thinking about this idea 
a sort of a, a prayerful knowledge of who God is. Look at verse 1. To you, O Lord, I call, my rock. Be not deaf to me, lest if you be silent to me, I become like those in the pit. So the psalmist calls out to God. He calls out to the Lord. And he does this because he believes the Lord is there. It's not just, you know, therapeutic. He actually believes that there's a God in heaven who hears him and responds to him. And he's saying, Lord, please don't be deaf to me. Please hear me. I need to know that you hear me. That my words aren't just going up into the void. To you, O Lord, I call my rock. Be not deaf to me. You know, sometimes when we call out to the Lord, our hearts and our minds begin to play these tricks on us. And we think, you know, like maybe God's not there. Like maybe he's not real. Uh, Maybe this is, you know, it's just, it's not true. It just kind of rises into the nowhere. And the psalmist is saying, no, that's actually not true. God is there. The reason we have the scriptures is so that we can know the God that it is we cry out to and call out to. We can know his heart. We can know what he's about. It's right for us to call out to him. And what the psalmist is telling us is that he is never silent to us. Ever. Now, let me, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had this experience where you're calling someone and that infamous message comes up on your phone and says, call failed? You ever had that happen to you? It's really frustrating. And I want, I want you to think about what kind of person you are. When this happens to me, I have one of two responses. And it, most of the time, it's more like the latter, which you'll hear in a second. But, but when your call fails, like, what do you do? Some people do this. Oh, my phone's not working. I can't believe my phone's not working. Like, oh, I need to call them back. Uh, it must be inconvenient for them. Uh, my phone's not working. This is what the other person does. This is what I do most of the time. What's wrong with your phone? Like something's wrong with your phone because my phone's fine. I got four bars. I mean, I know my reception in this area, you know, like it's you. Can you get to a place where we can have a conversation? It's really important that we communicate here. You know, the reality is none of us knows how this works, right? It could be your phone. It could be the towers. It could be who knows what. None of us are, maybe some of you are. Most of us have no knowledge of this. We automatically assume the problem is with the hearer of what's happening. Like it's not me because I'm calling out to you. And now your job is to hear it and respond and to give me the answer I need. Like that's, that's what I kind of expect to happen here. This is very much can be the experience we have spiritually with God. I'm calling out to you. I expect you to respond. I need you to respond with a particular kind of answer in a particular kind of way. And if you're not responding, it's because maybe you're not who you say you are. And the psalmist is pushing up against that. He's saying, actually, when you call out to the Lord, he's like a rock. He will not be silent. He will hear you. He will respond to you. David calls out to God because he knows what God has done and what God has said. It's why we have the scriptures. It's why the psalm is here. That God is trustworthy. That he's steadfast. That he's faithful. That he's firm to stand on in the midst of this life. And this is the good news. Even when you can't understand how God's being faithful, it's actually not evidence he's not being faithful. It, It means that you don't understand. Because God is always faithful. And he's always our rock. And you can always count on him. What a wonderful thing it is for you to know, if you don't know this already tonight, that God is far more aware of what you need than you are. He's far more capable of being present than even you're able of longing for him. He's the Lord. You know, it was interesting when I was in Alaska, you could watch these massive pieces of ice go by. And I don't know if you've ever been on a cruise, but I had this strange compulsion, like, what if I jumped over the edge? Like, you know, I'm not going to, but like, what if I jumped over the edge and could, would I die as I make my way to the water? Or if I made it, could I climb up on that iceberg? Because some of these icebergs you could build a, like a small house on. I mean, they're huge, okay? So I was like, okay, if I jump off and I like toothpick and then I swim back up and I get on this iceberg, like how long would it take for them to do a U-turn before they sent a helicopter to take me to jail in Canada or who knows what would happen? But as we pass these icebergs, something something began to happen the wake from our very large boat hit these icebergs and they would either tremble or turn or sort of crack even and some of them and it was wild to watch some of them would just go and just turn upside down and I thought I'm so glad that I didn't jump out and get on that iceberg it's not as stable as I thought right You know, there's so many things in our lives that we think are absolutely essential for us to be happy. We've got to have this or we can't be content or satisfied. What if it's like an iceberg? 
What if the only thing you can actually count on is the rock, the Lord of heaven and earth, the one who made you and knows you and cares for you? But it's hard for us to believe that. Now, there's, life can be very, very difficult. Life will do a very good job of testing your faith because we live in a world full of brokenness and selfishness and things that aren't as they're meant to be. How do we then think? What knowledge can we have then? Well, the psalmist explores that. He talks about having a knowledge of where life leads without the Lord. Verse 1, if you're silent to me, I become like those going down to the pit. Now, this isn't just like, a, you know, a big pit like Mad Max or, you know, what? it's not just a crater. It's this concept of a, a, a sort of a big crack in the ground where you would have put cisterns. And the cisterns would fit very tightly into these cracks and they would hold water and they would keep it cool. And um, it's fine for cisterns to do that. But it's not fine for you to do that. Like, I don't know if you like tight places, but we're talking about being very deep in the earth, in a very dark place where you can't move very well. And just imagine if you're in danger in the midst of being in the pit. Like, it's not a place you want to spend very much time. It's a very vulnerable place. It's a dangerous place. And David is saying, God, if you are not who you say you are, if you're actually silent to me, it's like being in the pit. I'm trapped. I'm stuck in the ground. I don't know what to do. That's what life is like without the Lord. Verse 2, hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help. When I lift up my hands toward your most holy sanctuary. Hear me, Lord, when I cry out to you. Have you ever been so distraught that you've raised up your hands in frustration and went, ah! You ever done that? You know, raising your hands, it it can be that. But it's also a way of being vulnerable. Now, the morning crew did a pretty good job at this. But, like, just raise your hands for a second. Like this experience of rate, like this is not a very safe, this doesn't feel very good. You can put them down now. I'm proud of you. Like 95% of you did it and the 5% that didn't, that's okay. You can wake back up now. You know, this is, this, is a, this is a very vulnerable place to be. And David is saying, I am holding up my hands. I'm crying out to you in your holy sanctuary because that's the place where I'm going to find what my soul so longs for. And yet a life without the reality of who God is, you're reaching out to nothing. You are only what you're able to pull off or whatever you can sort of think. But when David cries out to the Lord, God responds to him as his rock because God loves him. Let me ask you this question. Do you think God loves you because you're a good person? Or do you think God loves you because he is good? God loves you because he's good. We read in the scriptures that while we were yet Christ's enemies, he died for us. Look, God is in the business of convincing you that he loves you. That he's a rock you can stand on. That he will be merciful to you. That he will not give you what you deserve. That's what mercy is all about. God gives us what he has for us, not what we've earned or deserve. He's gracious to us. It's always God's way to do that because that's who he is. And when you begin to experience that, it begins to shape you and change you and mold you into the man or woman God's created you to be. You won't become that any other way. You can't muscle it. You can't will yourself into it. God must be gracious to you, and he is. David raises his hands to God, this vulnerable kind of position, and God responds. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen like a, like a two- or three-year-old little girl reach her hands up to her mother. And what happens if her mother goes, no, not interested? They wail, they protest, they collapse on the ground, they cry. And you know why? Because you're my mom, And when I need you, you're supposed to be able, like you're supposed to be there. And I will not accept that you will not be there for me. I protest, you know, with all of my energy as a two or three year old. David raises his hands to the Lord. And what he discovers is that God is present for him. That the moment he raises his hands, God is gracious to him. David knows how awful a thing it would be if when we raise our hands toward God, God didn't respond. And David says, please don't do that. I'm raising my hands towards your holy sanctuary, which is a way of saying David is reaching towards the promises of God. God, please be who you say you are. And the Lord says, I am your rock. David goes down this path a little further of what it means to live in the knowledge of his, as if God is not there. In verses 3 to 5, he says, We're dragged off with the wicked, the workers of evil, who speak peace, but have evil in their hearts. That's a kind of living that leads to a place where God's will and his ways are irrelevant. And that's a place of dysfunction and destruction. 
No one wants to be there. Even if you think it's attractive, it's a lie. It's a way of being that uses our own desires and our hearts as the center of what we need to do and where we need to be, and it's a lie. God calls us to something else. You know, it seems so obvious to say it, but I will because we often live this way. But we aren't perfect. We don't know everything. We're not all-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient, all those fancy words. We're not that. We don't have control of everything. Now, maybe if you're three years old, you haven't figured that out, but you'll figure it out. Like, you're not in control. And the reason that's scary is because we begin to wonder, okay, if I'm not in control, who is in control? And is the one who's in control, does he have my good at his, at his center? God's answer is yes. You know, um, this kind of, if you can kind of get this imagery of a child reaching to their, to their parent and the parent ignoring them or David reaching out to the Lord and just what if God didn't respond, it's terrifying. But what we discover in the scriptures is that there is actually one who has experienced what it's like for his father to turn his back on him. Really, no one's experienced this that's alive today. Everybody who lives gets to experience friendship. They get to experience air they get to experience water they get to experience food they get to experience joy those are all gifts of God even people who hate God get to experience his good gifts but what if you could actually experience or see someone experience the absolute turning away of the father from that person and what we read in the scriptures is amazing about Jesus as he's on the cross these two criminals next to him, both on a cross of their deserving. And one of the criminals looks to Jesus and says, remember me. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Like, you'll be with me in paradise. A man who had lived his entire life in opposition to God cries out with what he has and God is merciful to him. Doesn't give him what he deserves, gives him good things because he's good. So Jesus forgives him in that moment. Then, after offering hope to this criminal, Jesus looks to his father and experiences the very thing David is begging to not have to experience. And he says, Jesus, quoting Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knows what it's like to be absolutely forsaken. And he has experienced that so that you and I never have to. No matter what circumstance you're in, there's enough people in this room, there's, there's tragedy in this room. No matter what it is you're experiencing, God wants you to know that he is a rock for you, that he's present with you. It doesn't mean he's going to take it away right now because this life is full of suffering, but what it does mean is that you will not be alone. The God of heaven and earth and spoke creation into being says to you, I will not forsake you because I forsook my son and that by grace and through faith you can have the certainty of my presence. That's what living life with the knowledge of God leads us to. The living life as if God is not who he says he is leads to this pit. It leads to fear. It leads to a sense of absolute abandonment. It leads to all of these things. But a life seeking after him, as we read in verse 6, leads to this. David says, Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. David has a knowledge of what life is like with the Lord. And sort of the shorthand for it, if you're wanting to think about what, what's a way to characterize what it means to live as if God is who he says he is, it's blessing, blessed. The presence of God's promises and the presence of his mercy and the presence of his ways in our life bring life. That's the great revelation that we discover. The Lord hears us, David says in verse 6. And the Lord hears us when we cry out to him for mercy. And he responds. Like what if you could know right now what it means to understand that God is responding to you right now. You know, the, God has spoken in his word to tell us that when we call out to him, he responds to us. The Psalms say repeatedly, God gives grace to the humble and opposes the proud. If you will approach God in humility, God will always respond what does that response look like? I'm going to give you three. There are, there, are, there are many more, but these are three things that you can expect to happen when you pray and you seek God. One, the Lord responds to you through his spirit, testifying with your spirit. For all those whose hope is in Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in you, and God is interacting with your soul at this very moment. The fact you have any sense of shame over your sin means the Holy Spirit is at work. 
The fact you have any desire to begin to understand who God is, that means the Holy Spirit's at work. God is responding to you even now. Romans chapter 15, verse 13 says this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. The Spirit is the source of power for us, the source of hope for us, the source of joy for us, the source of mercy for us. All those things, God gives us his spirit to massage those things into our hearts as we seek him and trust in him. So God responds to us through the testimony of his spirit to our spirit. Secondly, the Lord responds to us through the work of his spirit in the lives of other people. That's why as the church, we call one another brothers and sisters in Christ. We are family. God's at work in me. And when I pray for you or when I seek to encourage you or when we see one another in need of encouragement and we do that, that is God through his spirit working in us to remind one another that he is who he says he is, that he is present. It's why we pray for each other. It's not just like a nice little thing we do. When you pray for someone, you are enlisting the heart of God for that person and God hears the cries of his people and he responds always. And so the Lord responds to us through his spirit, testifying with our spirit. He responds to us through the work of the spirit in other people. And God responds to us by giving us his word. If you really want to know the heart of God, read the scriptures. How much more tangible could God be? A book given to us to reveal God's will to us so we might know him and trust in him. 1 John 3, 16, or 14 and following says this, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, all Scripture is God is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof and correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The scriptures are given to us by God that we might grow, that we might be shaped, that we might be challenged. You will be challenged. There are things you believe that are true right now that the scriptures are going to undo in you over the course of your life, and that is a good thing. It's why Christians really can be the most humble of people, because God's revealed himself And we're all in process, and he's at work in us. You know, it's a great encouragement to me as I get to help out a little bit with children's ministry in our church and work with the staff who care for our children. The whole reason we do VBS, the whole reason we do children's ministry, the reason we have the preschool, all these things, it's it's based in this, this reality of what Paul's talking about here, or what John's talking about here. How from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. It's our prayer that in all of our ministries that care for children here, that somehow God would use what happens here at Christ the King to equip them and to acquaint them with the sacred writings that they might for the entirety of their lives call back to the rock of their salvation. That's our prayer. That's our hope. And by God's grace, that is precisely what will happen because he is faithful. God uses all these things to answer our hearts when we cry out to him. God is not silent. If we call out to him, he responds. He has responded. And part of what this means for us as you think about God responding to us is I want you to kind of think about two categories, you know, sympathy and empathy. God has sympathy for us. He mourns with us for sure. He understands the difficulties in our lives. He he has grace on us. He is merciful, which means he does not give us what we deserve. He gives us what he has for us. Blessing. So he has sympathy, of course. But he also has empathy. And this is not God feeling sorry for us. Rather, God feels our pain. That's what the doctrine of the incarnation teaches us. That Christ was born into this world as we were. Walked as we have. Lived as we have. He died, he rose from the dead. And so when God responds to us in prayer, he responds as one who understands what we've experienced. Jesus himself experienced. Paul writes in Philippians 2, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. Jesus shows us compassion because he understands our situation. Jesus knows what it's like to be loved. He knows what it's like to be hated. Jesus knows what it's like to be cherished. Jesus knows what it's like to be abandoned. 
He knows what it's like to have someone smile at him, and he knows what it's like to have someone mock him. God responds to us as one who understands. So this cry that David makes to God is filled with the reality that we worship a God who knows us and loves us and treasures us. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My my heart exalts and with my song I will give thanks to him. The God of heaven and earth, through his son Jesus Christ, makes an appeal to you that he is a God who cares for you, who loves you, who cherishes you. Now, this is where it can get a little tough spiritually for us. Because knowledge is something we're into. If I can gather enough data, then I, you know, I've got it figured out. I was talking to a, a man this morning. He was saying that his kids, when they were, they were looking something up, it, they typed it in Google. And Google didn't have like, much of a search result. And they were like, well, it must not exist. Like, that's just not real. You know, Knowledge is more than just uh, sort of uh, being acquainted with the facts. It is not enough for you to grow spiritually and to really experience the abundant life that God promises by simply knowing the truth. The Pharisees knew a lot. They knew the scriptures backwards and forwards. Being an encyclopedia of the Bible is not what God has for you only. It is true he wants us to know the scriptures. Absolutely, we should search out his ways. But really, where God is leading us through the knowledge of his scriptures is to the ability to have a prayerful hopefulness. And not the kind of hope that says, I hope it's not going to rain, or I hope this sermon's almost over. Don't worry, it is. But it's like a lasting hope, a certain hope, a promised hope. Listen to how, again, how the psalmist talks about this prayerful hope. On the one hand, kind of the negative, verses 3 through 5, he says, don't drag me off. Please don't let me be deceived into thinking that I'm good at being the king of my heart, as if, um, you know, I know what's best for me. Now, this is David praying it, and that's good news because David's got like a really bad rap, right? Murderer, adulterer, liar, schemer, doubter, power mongerer. Like, if he's the ideal, we're in trouble. And David's saying, Lord, please don't let all of that define me. Please let there be more, which leads us to this positive aspect of what we find in verses 6 and following. God has this for us. You know, what are the things that are the king in your life? Like, what, is, what are the things that, that you consider to be paramount that if you don't have, you just cannot be fulfilled? You know, maybe it's a king. It's probably not because we're Americans, so that doesn't really work for us. But I, I looked something up. I thought it'd be interesting for you. If you think about the kind of hope people put in kings, I want to read to you about two kings. One, this was in 1995, okay? Oyo was the youngest monarch in the world. He was three years old in Uganda. And when the coronation ceremony began, the toddler slid off the throne, ran away, and hid in his mother's lap. Like, that's super cute, but that's not the king you want on the battlefield. You don't want to hand him a sword. Like, he can't can't carry it, right? Or what about this? Legend has it that in 309, Persian nobles placed a crown upon the belly of King Hormid's widow. So they placed a crown on her belly, all right? Inside was history's first fetal king. He ended up ruling for 70 years, and in the late 4th century, sort of his legacy is that he successfully ousted Christianity from the Middle East. Thankfully, that's actually not the case. God's actively at work in Iran, which is where he was the king. You know, what's your king? If those are the best that we can come up with, we're in trouble, but they're not. Verse 6. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exults, and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. That's the king we worship. That's the one that we look to. Not false promises, but the one who is actually able to be your battle shield. Maybe that's how you need to think of God this week, as your shield and protector. He is. Or maybe he needs to be your strength this week. You've got something coming up this week, and you're thinking, how can I navigate this? God is your strength. Or maybe he's the one that needs to be your saving refuge, whatever it is. God is faithful. God is gracious. He fulfills his promises. He is the rock. He will not be deaf to you. 
You know, it's one of the wonderful promises that we're able to cling to as Christians is that we have a Father who always hears us and who is always accessible to us because of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. That by putting our faith in him, we have access always. Now I'm going to close with reading this. This is the, the memory verse that our kiddos memorized this week from Matthew chapter 5, which says this, and I think it's a good way for us to think about kind of our role in the world in light of these promises that God's given to us. Matthew 5, we read this, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. That's really what we want for ourselves, for our children, for one another, for our community, is that they would see this light of this King that we worship here because we can trust him. He is our rock. Now, as we approach the table this evening, just consider that. Like, where do you need to be increasing and adding God or asking God to add faith? Is it strength? Is it a shield? Is it a protector? Is it knowledge? Like, what is it? God is faithful to answer that prayer. Let's pray together as we approach this table now together. Lord, we do give you thanks that you are our rock, that you are faithful to us, that you are one who does not give us what we deserve, but rather you give us what you have for us because you are good. We give you thanks that you are our shield, that you are our protector, that you can be our strength. And we would ask, Lord, that even as we celebrate the supper, that you might take this opportunity as we worship together to infuse in us your grace and your mercy to remind us of your presence and your power that we might live by faith we ask all of this in christ's name amen